Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another Indie Game Friday, where each week I take a look at a different independent computer role-playing game. You know, this week I felt like actually playing a solidly good game for once, one that I've actually heard of and heard was good, although I never actually played it before, so I'm clearly a little bit late on this one. But hey, as I said, I haven't played it before, so I thought I'd take a look at it. Developed and published by Kerberos Productions, Sword of the Stars The Pit is a roguelike from back in 2013, so several years ago now. This review will cover the Osmium edition, which includes some DLC as well. Sword of the Stars The Pit is a semi-traditional sci-fi roguelike with an active turn-based combat and exploration system. It has a skill system, multiple classes, some of which change the way that the game plays, equipment and crafting systems, and with the Mines Game DLC uh, installed, it has psionic powers. In terms of plot, there is a plague coursing through your world. Seeking a cure, or another objective if you're one of the DLC classes, you travel to the Feldspar Mountains, where a massive pit contains an ancient alien research facility. Some characters may have other motivations, but generally they just have to progress through a 30-level dungeon to acquire whatever they've been sent there for. When you start a new game, you select between difficulty levels. There's easy, normal, hard, insane, and seriously, as well as two game speed options that reduce the number of rooms in each floor and of the floors in the overall game total individually. You may then select your class. The core game only had three classes, the Marine, the Engineer, and the Scout, but subsequent DLCs have added the Scion, the Ranger, the Warrior, the Seeker, the Striker, the Shepherd, the Mercenary, the Lich, and the Medic. The initial three classes were all human, but most of the alternate classes are from species in the setting. Each character class has a background, a list of starting equipment, starting stats, and starting skills. Furthermore, some of the classes change the mechanics up a bit. For instance, the Lich doesn't even have a hunger bar, but just health and psi points, but they only die when their psi runs out. Once you're in the game, you are presented with the area you're displayed as an overall head map. There is a fog of war, but also a line of sight mechanic. Walls and trees and other objects block your line of sight, but characters also have a cone behind their head representing the limits of their peripheral vision. One cannot, after all, look directly behind one's own skull. The name of the level that you're on is in the upper left, along with the character portraits. Mostly you'll just have the one character, but you can occasionally pick up teammates, hirelings, or other minions. There's a number on the portrait indicating how many times they can act before the game passes to the next turn. This is normally not an issue, although once you've moved that number of tiles, nearby enemies' moves are then calculated, so there may be a delay when you hit it. In the upper right-hand side, you can hit an indicator as to the difficulty you're on, the time you've spent in game, in turns, and the area that you're in. In the lower left, there's the status HUD. Most characters have a health, a food, and a psi point bar, with the health used to determine life, food decreasing with your actions and your movements, and then psi points using to fuel psionic abilities and special abilities. There's also an icon to allow one to open up the SOTS decks, where you can go ahead and access in-game information. Messages you've decoded, recipes that you've uncovered, modified gameplay options, uncover details on weapons, items, and monsters that you've run across, see the gameplay log, and see any in-game awards that you've earned. Interestingly enough, the recipes, messages, and various lore are accumulated between characters, so unlocking them for one unlocks them for all future runs. At the bottom of the screen there is the experience bar, which fills up as you kill things. It shows your level and class as well. Finally, there's your current weapon and ammunition. You can cycle between weapons easily. If you have psionics and put them on a quick bar, these will show up on the left-hand side of the screen, and if you put items like consumables in a quick bar, this will show up right above the experience bar. You can access your inventory and your character sheet for further reference. Your inventory shows collected equipment and gear. Characters may equip a helm, armor, two accessories, something on the waist, something on the legs, and something on each arm, although this actually may vary depending on the species involved. You can also place up to four consumables into quick slots. Consumables can have a variety of effects, from your basic healing, restoring psionics, or increasing food supply, to repairing items, opening locks, and so forth. Your character sheet shows a summary of your character's statistics. There's your basic class and level, followed by health, experience, and psi points. Armor is based on the armor you wear, and then there's armor versus ballistic, which is specialized against ranged attacks. Food shows how full you are, and then radiation shows how much radiation you've been exposed to. You can also suffer from various afflictions, such as wounds, poison, disease, and more, and these may have levels. They build up and become more deadly when you get repeatedly poisoned or diseased, but you can actually let them expire over time. 
Characters have four main stats besides this, set according to the class selected. There's Might that impacts physical damage, Finesse that impacts accuracy, Brains that impacts tech skills, and Power that impacts psionics. As you increase in level, you get additional stat points to distribute amongst them. Finally, there's Skill Points. There's a variety of skills, each of which is associated with one of the four stats. Characters have all skills at different levels, although some character classes have a much easier time learning some skills than others. There's your basic interaction skills, lockpick, electronics, mechanical, computer, engineering. Then the combat skills, pistol, rifle, assault weapon, heavy weapon, dis there is a knife, blade, and spear. There's utility skills such as decipher, traps, medical, foraging, biotech, and then the uh, psionic skills such as empathy, telekinesis, war mind, redaction, manifestation, mecha empathy, resistance, and necrotech. Skills improve through use in game, but you also get skill points each time you level up, which can be used to improve any skill that you want, so long as you can afford it. The Psionics tab, if you have it installed, shows Psionic categories along the top with abilities under each. Abilities are automatically unlocked as you build up that particular category of Psionics. These two can be assigned to quick slots. Psionics do use Psionic points to use, but they also often have a cooldown, which requires you to wait a fair number of turns before you can use them again. And that brings us to the gameplay itself. As I mentioned before, you move around the map seeking to find the ladder down. Along the way, you can encounter enemies. It can seem like a free roam game at times, but it is indeed turn-based, which you'll note when you do come close to an enemy, since all of a sudden that'll begin to move between your turns, and in fact you may have to wait for your enemies to all finish moving. When monsters come into view, you can select a weapon and attack them, targeting them either with a cursor or with a mouse where necessary. Many weapons do simply auto-target the nearest target. Slain enemies add experience to you and may drop things. Items that you find on the ground can be picked up and put in your inventory for future use. Scattered around the pit are various items that you can interact with. There is range from containers to piles of trash to desks to machines. A great many of them, such as lockers, ammo boxes, etc., are simple containers that might contain loot. These invariably require a test of some sort of skill to open depending on what the item is. Rummaging through a desk or a pile of rotted debris may require foraging, while opening a locker may require lockpicking. A, opening a damaged locker may require a mechanical, because that's what you use to pry things open and so forth. Beyond containers, there are machines as well. Computers may, once the proper skill is used, give messages. These messages must then be decoded with a decode skill. The decode message, or partially decoded message, is then added to the decks for all characters to read. This does mean that characters with high decipher generally have far more to add for that kind of thing. Fixing other machines can enable healing or crafting. A medical bay, for instance, can heal your character, provided the character allows it. Repair stations can attempt to repair your weapons and armor, which do degrade with use. The crafting stations might be cookers that can allow you to combine ingredients to make food, or lab workbenches that let you craft equipment, and so on and so forth. You can also come across various prisoners. When you release them from their prison, they may be convinced to join you, offering a second character to progress through the dungeon. When this happens, play switches between the two characters whenever you enter combat, otherwise the secondary character simply follows you along as you explore. Aside from that, it's pretty standard for a roguelike. You wander through the dungeon, collecting resources, avoiding dying. Rooms may have traps both on the floor or at the doors, and some may be locked, requiring lockpicks to open, and so forth. As for the basics, it's a really solid but relatively standard roguelike. Graphically, it's a strange mix of hand-drawn and retro-style pixel art for the UI, which I think only really works because the UI more resembles a computerized display on an otherwise cartoonish background. The music is excellent, and the soundtrack is available as a separate download. Where the pit really shines, however, are in the little details of the adds. The line-of-sight mechanism can keep you guessing once enemies run off or decide to route around. You may get to know that an enemy is about due to come towards you that turn because all of a sudden the game starts lagging between you and your movements, indicating there's something taking its own moves. You may not know where it is, however. Acquiring a variety of equipment poses a fun challenge, at least as it does in other roguelikes, but the need to maintain the equipment before it breaks and stock appropriate ammunition for those types that require it adds a bit of a survival element to the game, matching well with the need to keep your hunger bar up. The crafting system is interesting, although you really won't get much into it until you discover a few recipes, or, you know, look them up. Recipes aren't random, but things like color-coded biomods you might pick up are. 
Between biomods and particular weapons, you can theoretically get a fair amount of gear that will vary depending on your playstyle and actually change your playstyle to the gear. The presence of psionics is a nice addition of spell-like abilities into the mix. Their cooldown keeps them from being used as a primary weapon in most instances, although they'd completely outclass the weapons if this wasn't the case. The addition of the dex that accumulates messages, details on enemies and items and recipes does make for a tiny bit of permanent progression even with the permadeath system. Finally, the characters really do play very differently, or at least in most cases. I'd be more disappointed that more didn't come with the original game, but the collection is actually very reasonably priced, and what DLC doesn't come with it isn't that much and can usually be found on sale or in a bundle. In fact, all of it can be found in a bundle pretty easily all in all, and I think if you do that, the pit is well worth the price. I do think that the controls can get a little bit clunky, and sometimes the RNG can really get you. I know I played a marine during one playthrough and hardly got any ammo drops and ended up trying to kill everything with a knife. Then in another I played the Necromancer and he was getting ammo drops left and right even though he barely used it. But then, this is a problem with all roguelikes really, so I can't really pin it on the pit in particular. All in all, I can see why this game came so highly recommended now. It is admittedly not my favorite genre being a sci-fi game, but I can easily see myself playing it on and off well into the future, like so many other roguelikes that I have on my to-do list that I just occasionally drag up from time to time. Anyway, on that note, I'm going to wrap it up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with Indie Game Friday, Sword of the Stars, The Pit, Osmium Edition. As always, I'll put a link to where you can pick it up below. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content, both tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye. And if you are still watching, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my supporters, the top tiers of which are listed on the screen, without whose support I would not have been able to offer the variety of content that I have on this channel throughout the years. If you're feeling particularly generous and would like to join them, you can support the channel. Uh, there are a variety of options to do so. I have a Patreon, a Subscribestar, as well as channel memberships enabled. If you are not in a position to contribute, simply leaving a like, a comment, or sharing my videos are all wonderful ways to help the channel grow without spending a dime and are all greatly appreciated.